This is a bit of biology with Mr. Rock, and today we're going to be doing the Unit 8 review on evolution. Just like in genetics, we devoted a lot of the video to Mendel. In evolution, we are going to devote a lot of the video to Darwin and his finches. Charles Darwin is considered the father of evolution. So what did Charles Darwin do? Darwin traveled to the Galapagos Islands and he studied finches. And one thing he noticed with finches was that their beaks, so each island had its own species of finch, and their beaks were different depending on the island that they were on. And that was mostly dependent on the food source. So if they were on an island with fruit, then they would have a smaller beak. If they're on an island with insects, they would have a really thin beak. If they were on an island with shells, with nuts on the inside, they would use their beaks to crack open the shell, so they would need a really big beak. So through these observations and many other observations, Darwin created the idea of natural selection and also descent with modification. That all There was originally one finch, and then over time, the finches were slowly modified through natural selection in order to create new species. So let's talk about natural selection as it's a huge driving force for evolution. Before we can understand that, we got to understand what an adaptation is. An adaptation is an inheritable trait. So that means a trait must be embedded in that DNA. It's an inheritable trait that increases an individual's fitness. And what is fitness in evolution? That's your ability to stay alive, to not get eaten, and your ability to reproduce. So now that we understand adaptations, let's go into natural selection. Natural selection is the process where the environment, please star this, please circle it, do whatever. It's the environment selecting which traits are going to be successful. That's natural selection. It happens naturally out in the world, in the environment. Environment is the selection pressure. This is different than artificial selection. Artificial selection, you can see it through dogs and through livestock. This is the process where humans, humans are going to select the traits in a species that we think are successful. So choosing really, really large chickens to reproduce with one another, choosing certain dog species to reproduce with one another, humans are artificially selecting the species and mimicking evolution. So. We've been doing this for thousands and thousands of years, and we're going to continue to do it in agriculture and probably dogs as well. So that's Darwin. Uh, that's natural selection. Now let's go over some of the evidence for evolution. Remember, evolution is thrown around. It says it's a theory, and some people don't know how we use theory in science. A theory is a very well-tested and well-supported idea. So evolution is a theory, and it's backed up with significant amount of evidence. Examples of this would be the fossil record, specifically with whales um, and horses. And there's a lot of other fossil records, even humans with Lucy. But the fossil record shows small changes in a species over time. So it showed gradual change based off of the layer of earth that it was in. So that's really cool. Structures, this is a very, very brief overview of homologous, analogous, and vestigial, but if you're trying to cram or you're trying to study for your test, homologous has different functions. Pentedactyl limbs, the arm, the whale of a, uh, sorry, the fin of a whale and the bat wing, all of them are pentedactyl, but they all use them for different functions. Analogous is the same function. So analogous structures would be the bird wing, the bat wing, and the butterfly wing. All of them have a different structure, but they use them for the same function. And then finally, vestigial traits or structures is evidence of evolutionary history because they don't really serve a purpose. So an example of this would be goosebumps uh, or our tailbone in humans. We don't use goosebumps. We don't need to move our ears, and that is 
evidence or remains of our evolutionary history. Observations is another way we've learned about evolution through the peppered moth. That's the best example. All teachers, all classes, all biology loves the peppered moth because we saw evolution taking place within a very short period of time. So peppered moth changed colors in response to the industrial revolution. It went from white to black and we actually cleaned up the atmosphere, cleaned up the soot from the industrial revolution. And eventually the peppered moss went from black to white. So they actually went back to their original color, which is really cool. And then finally, DNA. Now that we know more about DNA and we can uh, study, analyze DNA uh, from different animals, we can compare DNA between two species. And if the DNA is similar, then that shows that there's similar evolutionary history. So we share, we are very, very similar to chimpanzees and we share a lot of DNA with them, something like 98%. Uh, we also share 40% of our DNA with bananas. So that would show that we and bananas had a common ancestor that was a long, 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 long time ago. So still related, but very, very distant cousins there. And then finally, last question here is what are clodograms? Clodograms would have a place here in our review because they, it's a diagram or an image that shows evolutionary relationships. So on the top here, you might see letters, you might see species. Uh, the top of the clodogram is species of interest. And those are usually modern day species. So you can see sheep, snails, humans, chimpanzees up there. And then the one thing to point out would be the top of the clodogram is modern day. So that's modern day organisms, species of interest. And then the further down you go on the clodogram, the older or the further back in time you're going. So the bottom of the clodogram is definitely the oldest. Other things to point out, the branch points on a clodogram we call them three different things. One, we could call them a branch point. Two, we could call them a node. Three, we could call them a common ancestor. So a common ancestor is shared between two species. And with that common ancestor there, that is a species that no longer exists. So it doesn't exist anymore, but it was at one point an ancestor between B and C here. Finally, we'll throw this out there. What is a clade? It is all the organisms that come from the common ancestor. So all the organisms that come after a certain node or a specific node. And then finally, the last thing, traits down here. We can sometimes throw traits onto a clodogram. So we could throw nucleus, has legs, has hair, has placentas. And it could be a good way of understanding the clodogram. This has been a bit of biology with Mr. Rock signing off.